Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Galactic Armory. My name is Aaron, and with me here today, again, is Jamie. Hi, folks. Today, we're going to be doing a Bad Batch Season 2 Tech Helmet. Now, Tech has a lot of things going on with his helmet. He's got, uh, you know, the visor, the goggles, a couple antenna. It's a pretty complex helmet. And compared to Season 1, I think it's, uh, it's a lot less complex than it used to be, and I would say it's a lot cooler looking. But it's definitely got some mechanical properties to it that need to be thought of during this build process. So today we're going to be talking about how we go from a raw 3D print all the way to this finished helmet that you see now. We're going to go over some techniques that work, some techniques that don't work, and all sorts of painting techniques because this... This helmet actually spans about six months time. I started it back in September and Jamie here helped me finish it here in February. I wanted to finish the helmet when Bad Batch Season 2 was actually going on. So I did my best to prepare the helmet for painting and all that. And then we made the handoff. And it was a fantastic job. There was very little that I had to do before painting. But if I'm right, there was a lot of experimentation before this. Right. This, Like I said, this has been six months in the making. So some of my old techniques here... We'll talk about it aren't exactly uh my favorite to use anymore but let's go ahead and get right into it so starting off with the 3d print it is printed off into several pieces we do offer these 3d prints in the shop if you're looking to complete this project like this yourself also started selling the yellow goggle lenses as well as the drop down visor lenses in the shop we'll get to that later but for now we are assembling this 3d print using a few different things so what I like to do is kind of do a rough sanding of the edges before applying a little bit of super glue. To hold everything in place, I'm going to use a soldering iron to actually kind of weld the exterior and interior seams. Those provide a very quick join uh, while the super glue continues to cure. You can use something like CA Activator. I know, Jamie, you're a big it's fan of that. definitely a preferred method of mine. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what I would do now. But I'm also using E6000 because some of the parts had a little bit of a gap in there from printing. Use that just to kind of fill the gap on the inside seam and leave it for the glue to cure. It takes around 24 hours for that E6000 to fully cure. I am leaving the ears off for now because I want to kind of fully assemble it after we have everything smoothed out. It'd be very difficult to sand everything down with the ears on there. So we're going to leave those off for now. Yeah, this is a very three-dimensional helmet. So there's a lot of greeblies and there is a very specific construction order to get everything looking right. So we've got the base of the helmet fully assembled now. And usually I don't start with a filler primer. Usually I try and fill in a lot of a majority of the 3D print lines with some kind of resin or liquid. But I wanted to try something new. And so I tried this Krylon 2-in-1 filler and sandable. I had never tried it before, and I will probably never use it again because it is just terrible. So what were the main issues with it? So first, it goes on very thinly. I used basically the whole can to get one coat around the entire helmet. Wow. Two, it was very cloudy, and so it left a big cloud of particulates in the air. And three, it just smelled terrible. Like, it made the whole shop smell terrible for several days as this started to clear out like i had to turn on the ozone generator several times uh, after we left for the day came back and it still smelled and when you deal with three four projects at any one time that smell can really build up yeah and so i will never use this stuff again even if nothing else is available i would rather hand sand it all until it's glass smooth wow that says a lot coming up i tried a second filler and sandable a filler primer to fill in a lot of those 3D print lines. And this one I actually love. This is Duplicolor filler. It's around $12 a can right now, so it's a bit more pricey compared to something like Rust-Oleum filler and sandable. But it goes a lot further per can. It really has an incredible effect compared to the standards like Rust-Oleum filler and primer. Mm -hmm. I definitely think so. I think it goes on a lot, I don't want to say thicker, but a lot more evenly. It's got a nice spray to it. Great coverage. Great coverage. A can will get you very far. But again, this was, I was trying to see how far you could smooth out a helmet with just these kind of fillers. Not something I'd recommend starting with and trying. I ended up just abandoning the idea and moving on to the real technique. The tried and true method. Yes. One of my favorite ways to fill in 3D printer lines using this Bondo fiberglass resin. So this is a two-part resin mixture. It comes with its base and then a little uh, dropper of liquid hardener. You mix those together, and in about 20 minutes, 
this liquid will turn solid. And this is a very strong, very shiny, very thick finish. Right. So that's part of the reason why I like it. Since it hardens so hard, it acts as a nice base layer for all of your sanding down the road. You know, if you use something like a tube of Bondo, Bondo is very soft when it hardens. It's very easy to sand. And so oftentimes you can accidentally sand away too much and kind of just remove all of your progress. I like this fiberglass resin because it's easy enough to apply. You have to be careful not to run into any pools or runs of the resin, but generally you can apply it in a pretty thin coat around the entire helmet and it'll set you up very well for all the sanding you have to do later. You do want to make sure and wear gloves and a respirator for this though, because this stuff is totally nasty. You want to leave it to cure outside if you can, or in a well-ventilated area for at least 24 hours. Yeah, this is a professional material. This is uh, used for cars for automotive purposes mm -hmm. usually. So this is some heavy duty stuff. Do not treat it lightly. I should even be wearing long sleeves in here preferably because I think many of us prop makers have lost a little bit of arm hair to resins like this splashing up on your forearms. Oh, I definitely have. So since the resin hardens quite a bit, you're gonna need some power tools to help you with sanding. You definitely do not wanna start hand sanding this thing right away. With me here, I have a mouse detail sander. On there, I've got like a 60 grit yeah. pad of sandpaper. Very, very rough. Yes, you're gonna need something that rough to actually get you anywhere. And so I'm just doing light passes over the entire helmet. You can kind of tell where you've been based on the color change of the resin. It will get like turn a bit of a white, just indicating that you've already sanded there. You don't want to go all the way down to the plastic. If you've hit plastic, you've gone too far. And a pad of 60 grit sandpaper on some PLA plastic will just shred through it. So you want to avoid that if you can. I also swapped to my detail file sander to hit some of the areas like the recessed cheeks and any other hard to reach area that the fiberglass might have pooled or other areas that I can't reach with my mouse. Those tools are extremely good for hogging off a lot of material very quick, so do be careful when using it. Mm -hmm. I use these two tools all the time. I use my mouse sander basically for any project and the detail file sander comes in handy so much. It, sa it has saved me so much time hand sanding and so many hand cramps. So using those two tools, they're a bit crude. And so what we're going to be doing is filling in a lot of those roughed up patches with some Bondo glazing spot putty. Everybody's favorite red toothpaste. You cannot go wrong using it, but we are just going to be using it to touch up certain areas. So as you see, a layer of primer has uh, gone down in this helmet since it was last sanded. That will allow you to spot those trouble areas. Uh, so you can target it with some uh, Bondo, some thick layers so that it can be sanded down to a smooth finish. Right. I don't think I filmed it, but some of those, like, forget what they're called, like identification coats or something, in either a filler or a black, they really highlight spots that need more attention. And so I'm just applying it with my finger, running it over any spot that I could see that needed a little bit more work. And like I said earlier, Bondo is very soft compared to the resin, so you can definitely hand sand it. I think here I'm using a 120 grit pad of sandpaper. Just going at it, using the shop back to clean off all the dust because there will be a lot of it. You also see I have a respirator for this because of the aforementioned dust. And this stuff is nasty, so make yes. sure to wear your PPE. You definitely don't want to be breathing any of this in. But once you're done with the hand sanding phase, we can start to kind of refine the helmet even further. So here I'm putting on another coat of the Duplicolor filler. This is going to help fill in a lot of the very minor scratches and things left over from the sandpaper or the mouse sander. It does two things. It fills in those lines and it also helps us identify areas that need more work. So if you notice an area that needs more work, just put on some more Bondo, things like that, re-sand it, reapply your filler. And once everything looks good, we are ready to start super refining the surface of this helmet with some wet sanding. Yeah, as you said before, this really turns a printed piece that looks soft, it looks unrefined, into something that looks like injection molded armor. It makes it look truly realistic at that point. Right, it really takes it up to the next level. And here I just got the ears. I did actually notice that there was a few more spots on there after I applied some black primer to this. Saw the spots, put more Bondo on it, re-sanded, and then re-wet sanded. So wet sanding is one of the last phases of sanding that you want to do. That is just such a nice finish though. It's nice and uh, nice and shiny. 
And after you're done wet sanding, the surface should feel super smooth. It's hard to believe that you printed that in your own home and now you have this piece in front of you. It looks like it was vacuum formed. So after I got a coat of black primer on the base helmet, I tried using this Rust-Oleum Universal Satin White and I just did not have a good time with it. These kind of trigger guns, this can especially just made a huge cloud of paint. You can kind of see it coming off the helmet. It just made a huge mess around the area. It did not have a very deep color, and so I had to use multiple coats of it. I think I actually ended up switching cans just because I hated this can so much. And you know it's bad when you spray and 40% of your paint ends up in the air. Yeah, you can just see the cloud coming off it. It actually landed on some of my other projects, and like, not only did it you know, not do a lot for this helmet, but it also, I think that's the Commander Wolf, the medieval Commander Wolf in the background there. It actually got a lot of cloud dust on that helmet. I was not happy. Okay, Jamie, at this point, you have taken over. We have made a big time jump here. What's the first thing you do when you have this helmet? Well, after you've been through all of your trials and tribulations, getting, mm -hmm. this, right, getting this ready, this is when I step in. And first off, I'm just checking all of the pieces for finishes just to make sure everything's good. And it is, you spend a lot of time on this. And this, this is when I start to get a basic gray primer on everything. You know, we, we refined it a little bit beforehand, but I just want to have a flat gray ready on all of these pieces just so everything's starting at the same point when I start to apply maybe more translucent paints over the top of it. I love how you have the antennas just clamped at this, the end of the table there. I never well, it takes, a, it takes a lot of effort to uh, get those painted and not have them streak. So at this point, this is when I like to get my white base on this helmet, even if most of it won't be white later. Because it's a primer, this will allow me to add airbrushes, streaks, and it will go down really well and make sure that any of the paints will adhere and not streak or run or uh, rub off later. I definitely recommend this can of uh, white compared to the trigger version of the can. This stuff works a lot better. So having gone through many bad, bad helmets at this point, we have identified our paints. This uh, Vallejo German Grey is a fantastic off black, dark gray with some slight blue tones. That seems to be a perfect uh, screen match to the show. So I get a primer base on that just to work with later. This was just through an airbrush. Get everything nice and flat gray. Give yourself a nice starting point. So I'm getting the Greeblies done first out of the way because I know most of the work is going to be on the helmet. Make sure that you identify any spots that will be a different color. Tape them off. Real quick job and get everything a nice flat base ready for the details. And how are you gonna draw on those details? Well, I like to use a combination of just my eyes on a pencil and then a ruler just to check my work as I go. Um, I use a fabric tape and then when I'm trying to draw straight lines on curved surfaces, I make sure just to use a, well, a laser line, mostly used for war gaming, for line of sight rules and things like that. Yeah. That will allow me to apply a straight line on a curved surface and I get to follow that and refine it as I go. Is that what you originally got that laser for? Yes, it was definitely because much more nerdy things than this. So you see, now that I've refined the shapes, I've identified the shapes that he has on his helmet. And before you start fast typing at me, yeah. uh, this is change later. Tech is very difficult to get good references for because his visor is usually up. Yeah, it's always in the way. And 90% of the episodes are at night. So it's very difficult to get clear shots of every side of the helmet. This was identified later, watching Bad Batch, and I make sure to go back and refine the top stripes later. But in the meantime, I'm able to start creating a gradient with an airbrush to cr start creating the animated effect of outside areas being much darker and the top areas, our more outward facing areas, being much more light. And then I follow that up by tracing out the grays around his mouthpiece, his nose piece, and getting those two tones ready to go just with an airbrush. Yeah, and so what color are we gonna use for that gray on the face? So that is a combination of dark reefer gray and light reefer gray by Archive X, which are identified as one of the best for Star Wars color schemes. Mm -hmm. And I follow that through by doing the exact same on helmet band at the back of his head. Did we talk about the orange on the back of the helmet yet? No, we didn't. What, what color is that? 
So that would be SP Scarlet uh, by ArchiveX, and that is a ruddy orangey red. That's a great base that then you can add a lot more brighter oranges on top because we've identified these reds to be really weathered at this point in time. And with that, we can finally do the peelies. I love the peelies. I will say we've had we've had some struggles getting good references for helmets in Bad Batch Season 2. Like either the character doesn't want to wear their helmet or they're always in some dark desolate cave or the one that we're interested in looking at is off in the distance and extremely blurry mm -hmm. so at this point there's some details that are harder to reach so i just make sure to get a good brush and start doing it by hand you can remember you can always clean it up later and once i'm satisfied with that i will make sure to do the aerators and some cheek details so these animated helmets all kind of have a similar style to them like no straight lines, a lot of scratch marks in them. And how do you kind of replicate that? So I try to do that with a lot of stippling techniques because that seems to be what's on the edges of these refined lines. I like to use two distinct methods, which is using a piece of sponge and some tweezers, dipping that sponge in some white in this case, and just tapping that on the edges. That'll create a random effect. It'll look choppy. It'll look drawn on. And then I also like to use a makeup brush, uh, really good dry brushes like that, and start to just stipple into those edges and just refine it over time. So those makeup brushes are like just really soft bristles. Exactly. They're really good for holding on to paint and dry brushing. And they there's tons and tons of different styles that are good for different applications. So here it looks like you're doing a little bit of dry brushing to the dark spots of the helmet, basically all over, right? That's right. So a lot of these helmets, you can see that it looks painted. If you look close at an animated style, it will look like someone has actually drawn it with a brush. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to replicate that with some light dry brushing, just strokes of paint, little smears here and there, just to break it up visually and add some textural interest to the surface. And this is when I break out my favorite tool, the airbrush, mm -hmm. and start refining the lines so that all the recesses really pop. I like to just use some flat black, and then I start to mix up the paints just to uh, get some variance in the tone. It really adds a lot of life to the helmet, makes a very plain looking helmet have a lot of character very quickly. So we're going to be continuing with the weathering of this helmet. And you're kind of doing an interesting technique here. What are you doing? So I identified on this style of helmet that in all of the white sections, it does look much like the acrylic washes that we use really commonly with our white helmets. What I like to do sometimes when I want to really refine exactly where the buildup is, I will use a light coat of an airbrush paint. Black is, is the favorite. And I'll make sure to get some airbrush cleaner on a paper towel and just start to smear and wipe away some of that airbrush paint, build it up in certain areas. It'll just discolor the white and make it a lot closer to what we see in the show itself. It seems a lot more controlled than doing something like a black wash. Well, the black wash is great for large surfaces. This takes a little bit more time but allows you to really focus into specific sections. And one other thing that we noticed as well was a lot of text, fine lines, almost look... They look deliberate. So what we identified was some deliberate removal of weathering sections. So on a lot of his harsher lines, we were able to duplicate this by using an eraser and just erasing the paint away and controlling that to make these much brighter areas on high section would this work after the paint has dried or do you still have to, do you have to do this while the paint is still kind of fresh that's a great question and you can actually do this when the paint is drying and when it has completely dried it will mm. be rubbed off and it all depends on how thick you're layering on this airbrush paint now of course if you completely dump paint onto the helmet it's not going to rub off right. however when you're just weathering like this you can really control that to create streaks smears and uh, it's a really good technique for weathering i have to say yeah you get some great lines around the face area like around that gray part i think this replicated what we see in the show pretty well so after some detailing on all the greeblies we're getting to the point where we can probably put this together but of course as we got more references we wanted to make sure that it perfectly matched what we saw on the screen. So 
we later went back to the helmet and ensured that the band around the forehead is much thicker. Thank you, Tech, for finally flipping down your goggles in good light because it allowed us to see where we went wrong. Yeah, that's always the most frustrating part is sometimes you have to guess just based on limited references. And, you know, sometimes an episode comes out, you're watching it for the first time and you're like, oh, that's uh, that's definitely not right. It's just like that Leo meme when you're pointing at the screen from your chair or shouting. Yeah, but I'm usually a lot more upset. But it just goes to show that even though you've weathered this helmet and made pretty significant progress on it, you can still go back and change some things if necessary. And that's that's exactly right. The, these paints will layer over each other. You can always go back. Just try to match as best as possible the paint that you use. Try to remember the paint that you use and try to duplicate the tone. It will work. Just keep at it. And have some patience. That's what prop making, at least as a hobby, is all about, really. Make sure that you're doing it for fun, that you're having fun with it. And if having a super accurate helmet is important to you, then be sure and take the time to really nail those details down. You're always your own worst critic. So it's not in this clip, but once we've updated the, the stripes on the top of the helmet, we need to protect all this paintwork, right? Yeah, we spent all of this time refining and checking that everything is as accurate as possible and eventually getting that correct. And we want to make sure that that paint isn't going anywhere. So we use some matte clear coats, some Rust-Oleum, and just, that will just seal everything in and it'll dry in half an hour. And you are good to construct the helmet. And you generally only do one coat of this clear coat, right? That's all you really need just to make sure it's scratch resistant. So as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, uh, a friend of mine helped provide some laser cut acrylic to fit perfectly inside our own kits. And so we have the, the glass for the visor, like the drop down visor, as well as the goggle lenses. They're both a tinted yellow, and you can see the visor here has an etched in design on it. I think that's really cool. But uh, generally it just friction fits right into the visor, right? That's all I needed to do. It, it was able to just slip in with very little effort. I didn't even need to use the mallets at the side of the screen. Oh, <laughs> I see it there just in case. It's but a threat. You can add glue here, but I would say use caution because some of that uh, cyanoacrylate super glue can, it leaves like a, a white mark a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it will cloud up this glass and it'll make it misty, which is absolutely unnecessary for this. You can just friction fit this in and it will allow you to take that out and clean it in the future if mm -hmm. needs be. That's true. And here we are ready to construct everything. That is a beautiful looking set of a helmet, but yeah, let's put it all together. How are we going to do that? So make sure you do a dry run first that everything fits in well before you start to do this process. You don't want to put glue down and then find out it doesn't fit. So once you're ready to go, just apply some super glue to the area and just gently fit in these pieces. You don't want to risk snapping them at this late point. But when everything is dried with a little bit of accelerator in our case, you are done. I gotta say, I do love that accelerator spray just for CA glue. It works amazing, bonds instantly. And now we've got a fully assembled helmet that looks just beautiful. Jamie, how did you like this build? This was a fantastic build, and especially because I didn't have to do any of the sanding. Did a lot of the hard work for you, but honestly, it was sitting on my workbench for months, untouched, before you came and did a marvelous paint job on it. So this was a nice collaboration, I think, between the two of us, but don't think that I'm always gonna be doing all of your sanding for your helmets. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this piece and it gave me new respect for Tech and his style. Well, guys, that is the Tech Season 2 helmet all completed. I will say there are some details on the ear that we just didn't bother with. You can actually see his Thunderbolt and Lightning from Season 1 underneath, but I wasn't going to ask Jamie to paint all of that detail just to paint over it with a black. I was happy with it just being flat black. If you want those Thunderbolt details showing up underneath, feel absolutely free. But I am absolutely in love with this helmet. We're going to put it up on the shelf right of place. And if you guys want to complete a project like this, be sure and check out links in the description that sell the DIY kits or the 3D files if you have a 3D printer. I mention again, we do have the drop down visor lenses as well as the goggle lenses available in the shop. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you're also enjoying Bad Batch Season 2. I know uh, I definitely am. It's got some ups and downs and some very hard hitting emotions emotional moments what do you think jamie yeah there's a dave filoni always knows how to pull on the heartstrings yes he does i'm just worried he's gonna make us watch order 66 again somehow through like a flashback or just totally uh 
I don't know, out of nowhere. But thank you all for watching. I hope you learned something and I hope to see you again in the next video.